All right, good to be back with all of you. Uh, Samantha and I and the kids were gone in North Carolina for like four days. I think it was our first vacation in about 10 years. Um, and so it was with the in-laws, it was all fun, but it's good to be back with all of you guys. Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2 this morning, which is one of the longer chapters in the New Testament, not the longest. And so like we've been doing, we're going to survey parts of this and then slow down at other parts of this. And then on Wednesday, we'll be looking at chapters 3 and 4 together. The reason why uh, we're doing 3 and 4 together is that a lot of that section is more familiar and so uh, we're going to do like a broad survey of parts of that and then really slow down at the section in chapter 4, verses 14 to 30, when Jesus is rejected in his hometown. So in your preparation of that class, I would encourage you to spend a lot of your time in his hometown rejection section in chapter 4. But the uh, questions are back there. If they're all taken this morning, I'll go ahead and add some more uh, between services today. Uh, this is the outline chart of the book of Luke. A uh, couple easy ways to remember it. The first major chunk of the book, you see Jesus seeking the lost, uh, where he's going to those who are captive and blind and demon-possessed, and he's healing people and teaching people things that they need to know so that they can have free freedom in Christ. Um, and then the last, really, chapters 20 through 24, the end of chapter 19, shows what Jesus did in order to save the lost. And so uh, that's what we're looking at as we go through the overall trajectory of this book. I will point out that the first four chapters or so cover 30 years. So today we're looking at the young, the young Jesus, where we have his birth, and then we got one story between his birth and when he started his public ministry, and that's when he was 12 years old uh, in the temple. So uh, that's what we're looking at today. Um, uh, one, just a couple things to get us oriented towards this chapter. Uh, one of the themes that we've been seeing in Luke is that the gospel is for all people. Uh, we're going to see that when we get to the genealogy in chapter 3, that it traces all the way back to Adam, uh, Jesus' birth does. And so what he's going to do is going to be for all people. That theme will be seen a, a couple times in this. If you're into circul circling things in your Bible or noticing like marking up your Bible. One thing that is kind of cool to notice in chapter 2 is the progression of, of how Jesus is referenced throughout this chapter. So it begins in verse 16. He's referenced as a baby. And then in chapter, verse 40, he's called a child. And then in verse 43, he's called a boy. And then in verse 52, Jesus, like he's growing and becoming more and more of a man, and so what we see in this chapter is, is the most panoramic picture we get in the Bible of Jesus' birth to becoming older. Um, and so that's what we're looking at here. Outline of this chapter, you can outline this chapter geographically, where the first 21 verses shows you events happening in Bethlehem, and then 22 to 52 show you events mainly happening in Jerusalem. And so you see... Uh, two trips that the family makes to Jerusalem, the first when Jesus is an infant, and then the second when he is age 12. So that's how you can outline and think through what's happening in this chapter. Uh, any comments or questions as we get started into this? All right. Um, I like this. I'm going to show you a quote from somebody that I think just made an interesting point about what we're seeing overall happening in this chapter. Uh, Warren Wearsby said this, uh, his birth affected Caesar's politics, the ministry of angels, and the activities of common men. In that day, shepherds were looked upon with disdain, but God singled them out to be the first human messengers of the Messiah's birth. His coming touched even worshipers and even scholars. So he's making the point that in this chapter, the earthly realm with the highest of high, the politics, uh, the politicians, and then you've got the lowest of low with the shepherds are being affected by this. You've got uh, the spiritual realm with angels being affected by his birth. Jesus' coming into the world is uh, such a monumental thing that happens. God coming down and descending to his creation is what we're looking at in this chapter. So let's go ahead and start out by looking at the first event in Bethlehem, and that is the birth of Christ Let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. 
In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Uh, notice that in verse 1, like we've seen in chapter 1, verse 5, like you're going to see in chapter 3, verse 1, where it says in 3, 1, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. So 1, 5, 2, 1, 3, 1. There's all these different references to things that are actually happening in history. And it was during this time period that uh, the Caesar wanted to do this, this census probably to increase tax revenue or something like that. There's some debate about what this exactly was for. But here's a king of a nation just flexing his political muscles. I'll go ahead and I want a census. I want to know how many people I have that are, uh, that, that are under me. And this causes Jesus and uh, his mom and dad to go to Bethlehem because that's where they would be registered. And fulfilling Micah chapter 5 verse 2, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel. Um, notice that even though this king thinks he's, I would imagine, this king thinks that he's just this great powerful guy and he can just call this order out and everybody's going to scramble to go be registered, is actually serving God's divine purposes. And so whenever you think about what the kingdoms of men are doing and the great leaders of the world, all these people, could all of those things, as wicked as those people might be, still be used to serve God's purposes in some way or another? Yeah, it's happening at least here in this passage. So when they get to Bethlehem, Jesus has to be born. Uh, we don't get all the details of it, but where does he have to stay in verse 7? At an inn. And there's different debates people have about what it means that it was an inn. Does this mean that like... You know, the upper levels were like a, a hotel kind of thing, and below it was where animals would take, be taken care of. Because that word for manger is, is associated with uh, feeding troughs, which would be fitting that the bread of life would be placed in something like that. That's a possibility. Uh, but you see that he's got very humble origins in this passage. Like, mom and dad are scrambling. Oh, like, why did the governor have to, or the king say that he's going to be born at such and such a, or, well, I'm sorry, why did the king say that we're going to do the census at such and such a time? And now we're scrambling to get to Bethlehem to register. And, and it's, by the way, the time that I've got to give birth. So all these things are happening. And it causes Jesus to have to be born at, in a very hum humble circumstance. I really like this quote. When Christ first came, he was pushed into a barn. And we have tried to keep him there ever since. Have we made room for Jesus in our heart, routine, activities, home? You think about how when Jesus was first born and where he's kind of pushed off to the side, it almost predicts the way that we're tempted to treat him our whole life. Is it possible that in our life we don't really have room for him where he really belongs, but we keep pushing him out further and further and we compartmentalize our life, things like that. I think you can make a metaphorical lesson from that. Um, but I want to ask this discussion question, and this is on the sheet. What are some lessons we can learn from Jesus' humble birth? How does it challenge our perspectives on power, status, and material possessions? What do you guys think about that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, going back to the, the anointing of King David, he's got all these other brothers that, you know, they're older, pro- probably taller, whatever. And God doesn't look at things the way that man does. And you're not going to find Jesus being born in a palace. This is God coming down to man, and he's in what's likely a feeding trough. And it predicts the way that mankind is going to receive him. You're out with the animals. You were going to say something, Patty? No, you're, you're good. Yeah, very good. So where true power is found is found in this feeding trough. Now, in this, in this text, who seems to be more powerful? The emperor of Rome or Jesus in a feeding trough? The emperor sure seems a lot more powerful. But true power is here, rejected, not having the nicest place to stay. What else do you guys see with this? Yeah, Matt? Yes, good, good. Anything else on this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the rich young ruler and how he, he was all about earthly possessions and here's the king of the world that owns everything and look what he has. Um, good, all right. So with, with his birth now having happened, we get to the first people that hear about the birth of Christ, and that's this angelic proclamation to the shepherds. And I'm going to read, uh, I don't know how much of this we'll read, but let's start in verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Notice that theme there, that it's for all people. In verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Um, so uh, you got the, in chapter 1, the angel that's named is what angel? Who is it? Gabriel. In chapter 2, you got these other angels that are not named, and they're bringing good news of great joy to all people. Now, think about this question. Why do you think God chose to reveal the birth of his son to lowly shepherds? Okay, good. Their heart was ready. What else? The she- oh, yeah. Good. Okay, good. So the, the shepherds, if you think about shepherds in two different ways, in the ancient world, the way that you'd picture a shepherd would be by talking about a king of a nation. You guys have probably heard me say this before. This might be annoying. But the hieroglyphics of, of pharaohs and their sarcophagi thing, sarcophagus, they're, they're always holding two things. What are the two things they're holding? A staff, a shepherd's staff, and a flail. One is to talk about the loving guidance that a king is supposed to give, and the other one is the discipline that a king is supposed to give. That's what, in the ancient world, that's how they pictured kings, was as shepherds. And it's not like these angels are going to the shepherds, the kings of the nation. Instead, they're going to the literal shepherds, the lowly people. So Jesus has a lowly birth. The first people that find out about this are the lowly people. Uh, One of my favorite hymns is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I'm afraid that I understand that we we don't want to give the impression that we think Christmas is something that God has given us like as a special day to set aside and worship and all this kind of stuff, you know, whatever. Um, But that that hymn has some of the richest lyrics of any hymn that I've ever sung before. And I think it would do us well to think more and meditate more on what that hymn is saying. 
mild he lays his glory by, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. These, these shepherds are going to go and behold God in the flesh. And so look what happens starting in verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went up with, they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherd told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it has been told them. All right. Um, what do you make of the anticipation of these shepherds? What impresses you about these guys here? They went and they, they made great haste. I mean, can you imagine getting this? Do we ever make great haste? So we hear, okay, yeah, somebody's been born. That's the savior of the world. Uh, he's going to bring great joy and it's going to be to all people. How often do we make haste to learn more about this? Here they go and make haste to see a baby before he's ever taught anything, before he's ever done any miracles. The beholding of God in the flesh by itself is something that's a treasure. So when, can you imagine being Mary and you see these shepherds rush over to you? And by the way, we know from verse 21 that this is all happening within the first eight days of Jesus' birth because he's circumcised in verse 21 on the eighth day. So this is all first seven days. And suddenly one day like you're holding your new baby and he's cooing and it's oh cute. And then suddenly like somebody knocks on the door and it's a bunch of shepherds. What, what does it mean in verse 19 when it says that Mary treasured up these things in her heart? Yeah. Yeah. And she's meditating on it because she knows there's something significant about it. Yeah, Matt? Yeah, I, can, I think in, there's a couple times this chapter uses this phrase, Mary treasured these things up in her heart. I take it that with the, the amount of research that Luke has done he's he's going to all the other documents that have been written about the life of Christ and he's interviewing people and I imagine that he he sits down with Mary and he's got like maybe he had like a podcast back then and they had these like cool microphones and they'd all sit around this big table and be like so Mary how did you feel about that you yeah, know I really treasured it up and what did that I think he's interviewing her and he's writing down the things that she vividly remembers. And she's saying, yeah, like he was born and it was really humble circumstances. And then one day, a bunch of lowly shepherds, not, and they were really excited. And Luke's going, oh, interesting. Okay, he keeps writing these things down. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, good, good. Yep. Uh, to me, it, it points to her spiritual faith. She is, you know, yeah. She, she keeps it all in her, in her, in her mind as she goes through life with this son of God. Um, and she would be rewarded. She says, hey, your parents can come here. They are going to. Focus 
Yes. So when, you're, when you have the mindset that treasures things up in your heart, one of the ways that you can know that is if you've had some false way of thinking confronted in your life, and then when that's confronted and you, you've been shown that your way of thinking about whatever it is is wrong, you stop talking in those ways that you used to talk about. In other words, what I'm saying is you hear a conversation about some, some spiritual matter, something in the Bible that you hadn't seen before, and the people that treasure it up in their heart don't just go on that same day, oh, that was interesting, and then forget about it. They keep thinking about it, and it, and it becomes part of who they are. And so here's Mary meditating on all of these things, and the fact she meditated on it and thought about it allows her to be able, I think, to explain to Luke, these are the things that were happening, and I remember this vividly. So what are the things that you're treasuring up in your heart? What are, what are the conversations you've had with brethren that go, well, I never thought about that before. That needs to become part of the way that I think. I need to write it down. I need to meditate on it. I need to pray that God would help me with this. What is it that you're treasuring up in your heart? So in um, verse 21, Jesus is circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, and so that, like we said, the shepherds visited within the first eight days. This also shows you that Jesus was born under the law, like Galatians 4 says. Jesus is going to be obedient to the law. Um, and there's a lot of other things we could say about all that. But any other comments or questions through verse 21? Yeah, LR. Uh, back up a bit. Because you brought forth the personal son. Is it true that Dr. Joe that uh, Moses was the son of the nation that was given to God? And we see the comparison translated to Moses. Moses was put in the ark of Moab and took out the Nile saying, Moses uh, the daughter of Pharaoh. Yep. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very good connections. Yeah, good. Yeah, over here. Yeah, good. Yeah, it, what, they were so excited about a baby. Again, that hadn't done any miracles or teaching or anything, or made any promises to them specifically, and they they can't help but be they can't be quiet about this. Good, good. Anything else before we keep going? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. Good. Yeah. The, the kind of and, and the, the the hymn "Hark the Herald Angels Sing" just captures verses eight through twenty so beautifully. And and again, the lyrics in that hymn don't don't be afraid to sing that hymn. It it I know it has associations that we may not agree with or whatever. But the, just taking the song by itself is one of the best hymns, this most rich hymns that we can sing, I think. So, um, yeah. Sometimes we're afraid as members of the church to talk about Mary very much because we have a mindset that... We know what she's not. That's right. Yeah. We're, are we going to be something else because we're looking to her? Right. Right. Her love and her devotion was to God first. Yep. Those are things, that, and that's something we cannot, we cannot dismiss that, but we cannot. Very good. If the only thing we ever discuss is what Mary isn't and who Mary isn't, I think we're missing a lot of really valuable lessons in Scripture. Oh, yeah, sure. We got to be able to combat false doctrine, 
but there's so many positive lessons to learn from Mary that, that we don't just scramble to these passages and just know everything that we don't believe about it. So, very good. Um, in fact, uh, I will say something about that in just a moment. So, 22 to 52, shifting then geographically, we spend most of the time in this chapter in Jerusalem. There's a couple times where they go back to Nazareth, but generally, the rest of this chapter are events that happen in Jerusalem. And so, um, what happens in this first visit when Jesus is an infant, uh, Mary has to go through this purification process, like Leviticus chapter 12 talked about after a boy was born. Uh, 40 days after birth for a boy is when a mom would go and do this purification. Interesting that Mary had to be purified. This is not to purify Jesus. And so going back to what we were just talking about, why would Mary have to be purified if she was sinless? And so she does have to be purified. What they bring in verse 24 is a pair of turtle doves, which in Leviticus 12 verse 8 was only for the poor families. So the fact that verse 24 says that they brought turtle doves means that Jesus was born in a poor family. Okay, so um, so when they come, so not only is it Mary's purification, but the firstborn also have to be redeemed, and that goes back to some things in Exodus that every firstborn child that is born belongs to God, and you have to go buy them back. And so here's them buying them back. But um, I, what I want to do is I want to read starting in verse 25, and I have, this question is on the material. Uh, I'll read the question before I read the text. Simeon, so that when they're at the temple, they're going to meet Simeon and an old prophetess named uh, Anna. Uh, It says, Simeon is described as a righteous and devout man who was waiting for the consolation of Israel. What do you think he meant by the consolation of Israel? Now, let's read starting in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said... Now, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child appointed, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Okay, all right, so try to imagine this now. You're going and you're offering your offering, you're going through the purification, you've had this child that's born, and then there's this like old dude that comes up to you. And he says a bunch of stuff that you're like, what, what does all of this mean? What was this guy, this guy that talks to them, what was he waiting for? The consolation of Israel. What does that mean? Comfort. Comfort. What, what else? Like, what, what would this, this consolation be? Relief? Deliverance. Deliverance. Like, all the promises that God had made to Israel of this one that was going to be in the line of Abraham, that was going to be a blessing to the world, this one that was going to be uh, in the line of David and was going to reign on the throne forever. All of these promises, these things that would bring comfort to the nation of Israel. This guy's been waiting for this. Now, in a greater way for us, is there a greater consolation coming to Israel the true Israel, God's spiritual family, how much are you waiting for the real, the the full consolation of God's people where all the tears will be wiped away? This guy is so enthusiastic about the first coming of Jesus. How enthusiastic are we about the second coming of Jesus? Now, any thoughts or comments on this guy and what we're seeing here? Yeah, it's more affirmation for Mary and Joseph. Okay, like we, the shepherds came and we treasured that up. And then, you know, uh, like 32 days later or whatever it would have been, we brought him to, the, you know, to do all this stuff. And then this old dude came up to us and he said some strange things. Then look at what he says in verse 35. And a sword will pierce through 
your own soul also? Can you imagine this old guy saying, and Mary, because of the birth of this guy, there's going to be a sword that's going to pierce through your own soul. Well, I think some of the initial fulfillments of this happen when Jesus is 12 years old at the temple in the next story. And they don't know where he is. And he's about his father's business and stuff like this. So um, all of these things would have been very strange for them to see and hear. But uh, any other observations or comments you guys want to make up to verse 35 here? Uh, yes. Yes. Yep. Yes, very good. You see all the reference to the Gentiles as well here. Um, in fact, there's two times that the Samaritans are mentioned in the book of Luke. And both times are in positive reference. The good Samaritan, the one that helps the guy that was beat on the side of the road. And then the story about the ten lepers. And I think it was only one of them that came back to give thanks to Jesus for the healing in chapter 17. Um, that, the one that came back was a Samaritan. So you're going to trace this theme throughout Luke. The gospel is for all. And if we prejudge anybody, we don't understand what the gospel is. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, how many people held Jesus? Here, here's Simeon, like, holding it as a baby and being able to say all these things. Good. What else? Yeah. Matt. Yes. Yes. And, and we should, what, remember one of the purposes of Luke, the purpose of Luke is to know with certainty. Look at all this confirmation of everybody who knew that something needed to come and these people acknowledged who it was. Um, but look, look what happens with Anna. Um, I'm gonna, I'll put the question up here again. And again, the questions in green are the same ones. I'm taking some of them from the printouts and just putting them up here. And so um, hopefully you guys have had time to think about some of these things. But uh, Anna is introduced as a prophetess who serves at the temple day and night. What can we learn from Anna's dedication to worship and prayer? Look at, starting in verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Now that's interesting because I thought the other tribes were lost. Maybe we need to rethink how we think about some of that. Uh, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day and coming up that very hour she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Uh, if you do all the math and figure things out, she, this woman's over 100 years old. And she's at the temple, and what, what is her custom? What is she doing? She's serving. Yeah, praying night and day, fasting, all of this in anticipation, like... <laughs> Is it possible, um, I, I, don't, I don't know this by experience yet, but if you get older and older and older, is it easy to feel like you've punched your ticket spiritually and you can kind of keep coasting? Absolutely. Like, you know, I, you know, I used to mark up my Bible all the time and oh yeah, I used to pray so much and I used to do so much and now it's kind of time for me to just sit back and just watch the news all day or something like that. Here you got this old woman and she is completely dedicated with all the energy that the Lord is still giving her, she's still giving it all to the Lord. And so she didn't, she was just always at the temple. She wasn't missing service, whatever. And so again, another, like Ryan said, another piece of evidence or confirmation to Mary and to give us certainty. Look at all these people who knew this. And look at the excitement they had about this. The, I don't think this woman lived to see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We're on the other side of it. Does what Jesus has, what he's accomplished, elicited prayer and fasting and thankfulness and, and this kind of dedication that we're seeing in, in her? Any comments or questions about, about her? All right, um, I'm just going to put this up here for a second. The, you can think about the, the couple, first couple chapters with these different birth narrative hymns. 
So you have the, and these are all the Latin terms that people have given them, so they all sound fancy and stuff. Uh, but the Magnificat was in chapter one, the Benedictus in chapter one, uh, the whatever, however you say that one, um, with the shepherds, and then however you say this last one, Nunc Dimittis or something like that, was what we just saw with um, Simeon at the temple. And so uh, if you wanted to collect the passages here about the, the hymns, those are the ones that we see in the first couple chapters. Anything else you want to say before we move on to Jesus as a 12-year-old? Yeah. Anything else here? Yeah. Giving birth to a promised son, good, good. Anything else? All right. Uh, let's look at then when Jesus, the second trip that they make to Jerusalem, uh, in, around verse 41, uh, they go to Jerusalem for the Passover, and it says in verse 39 that they attended Passover every year, so that shows you some cool things about the family. I don't see them missing the Passover for a baseball game something like that. And so here they are uh, going every year. Uh, so uh, they start leaving. And when they leave, they assume that Jesus is with them. And maybe that, that says something about they were used to him just always obeying or whatever. Um, don't always assume that Jesus is just with you. Is maybe one lesson that we can learn from this. There are three, you know, a couple days into the journey, like, whoa, what, where, where is he? I thought he was with us. Can, can we ever think that Jesus is just surely with us right now, not realizing that we don't, we're the ones who don't really understand him? And so look what happens starting in verse 46 when they find him and what they find him doing. Look at verses 46 to 48. After three days, interesting that it's three, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. All right. Uh, what was Jesus doing in the temple when he was found? Listening and asking questions. And this is what happens right before and right after. Like if you go back to verse 40. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. Look, go down to verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So what comes in between these two verses about Jesus growing? What was his discipline? Listening and asking questions. Listening and and asking questions. What, this is like, this is the habit that we hear about him doing, presumably from age 12 to 30. Listening and asking questions. Listening and asking questions. How did Jesus grow? How, how do we grow? Listen and ask questions. When, um, when Mary reprimands Jesus and then they end up having to go back home and Jesus says, didn't you know I have to be about my father's business? There's some versions that say father's house and father's business is probably a better translation, although the two would end up being the same anyways. If you're in the father's house, it's because you're about your father's business, so whatever. Um, and so Jesus is letting his parents know here, his earthly parents, that his relation to his father transcends all earthly ties. Now, this question was on the material. Jesus went back to Nazareth and was obedient to his parents. 
How does his example challenge us in our relationship with authority figures? Do you think Jesus understood more things spiritually than his mom and dad did at this point? Yeah. So does he have to submit to people who maybe knew less than he did spiritually? Yeah. Now, what if they told him to do something sinful? Then no. But maybe there's a lesson to learn in that about how we, how we uh, approach those who have authority over us, um, things like that. And that, that opens up a whole discussion that we just don't have time to get into all the details of. But you have to appreciate that as a 12-year-old, look at his discipline. How much do we expect of children? You know, like kids in high school classes are learning trigonometry and rocket surgery and whatever else they're learning. And, um, but like we, we can't just have like a deep in-depth study of Ecclesiastes. We sure about that? Kids are capable of a lot more. And here's Jesus, and, and I know he's Jesus, but why do you think a story like this is given to us? Because maybe we should be expecting more out of children than we do. It's one thing to learn from this. Anything you guys want to say about that? So you see him growing for the next 18 years. Um, and uh, remember when Jesus is in his hometown and people are saying, how, how does he do all of these miracles and these mighty works in Mark chapter 6? This shows you that during that time period, Jesus was not doing miracles. They're, like the Gospel of Thomas has Jesus, I think, pushing a kid off of a roof um, and then like freaking everybody out. And then he goes down and goes, ha ha, and then he raises him up from the dead, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Jesus wasn't doing anything like that uh, because when he starts doing miracles, his hometown people are like, where did he get all of this? He wasn't doing this kind of... So he would have been like a really solid kid that would have been really frustrating to be the brother or sister of because, you know, mom and dad are always, why can't you be more like Jesus, you know? Uh, but he's just a solid guy. And then one day, we're going to see in chapter 3 and 4, he's baptized, he receives the Spirit, the Spirit's going to empower him to do the things that he's going to do. Uh, but we'll get to that, Lord willing, on Wednesday. Any other comments or questions about any of this? Yeah, he's, he's got a lot of self-awareness here of what his mission is, what his purpose is. He was, yes, he was always God. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, uh, with those things in mind, I want to end with a prayer uh, in light of the things that we've studied from this chapter. So let's go ahead and pray together. Our gracious, humble God, uh, we thank you so much that... Uh, in your divine wisdom, you have come into this world. You sent your son to come into this world and packaged him in such a way that the elites of the world would, would not always be able to comprehend unless they had the humility to understand where true power is found. Uh, Father, help us to not be impressed with earthly riches. Help us to not be impressed with earthly wisdom. Help us to not be impressed with earthly power, but to understand, Lord, that the true divine power that your son came is what is truly powerful and can change our lives. Uh, Father, we, we trust you and we know that uh, in the things that happen in the nations and the kingdoms of the earth, that you are the one who's still sovereign above everything. And though there are so many things we might not understand, we can see even in the census in Luke chapter 2, that you used uh, the powerful of the world to serve your purposes. Help us to remember that. Help us to have that perspective and have the faith and confidence in you that we ought to. Help us, Lord, to understand that before Jesus ever did a miracle or ever taught anything, he was worthy of being worshipped. Help us to worship him because of who he is. Uh, we also think about the things that he eventually did and accomplished in seeking and saving the lost. Help us to praise him all the more for those things. Thank you so much for the humility that you have had in demonstrating yourself to us so that we can relate to you. Help us to appreciate that and understand that one day if we trust and believe in you, we will be exalted. Thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.